We are living through a time of rapid change. In this video, I'm gonna talk about what it's like to create content, tell stories, build technology in a world where everything is changing under our feet, where models, platforms, and incentives change on a monthly basis. I'm gonna share some of the things that I'm optimistic about, some of the things that concern me, and share some advice that's been helpful to me as I've navigated the last two years as a creator entrepreneur. Now, historically, things have been very stable, right? There are certain types of jobs that you get into where things don't change all that much. Innovation is happening at much more of a palatable pace where you can keep up with it, maybe even stay ahead of it. But now it is damn near impossible for anyone, including myself, to keep up with absolutely everything that's going on. So how on earth do you prepare for this future today? How do you stay sane in this time of rapid change? I've got four pieces of advice that I wanna share with you. First is you gotta jump off the deep end. You got to play test regularly. There's so many things that are coming out on a damn near weekly basis. New models, new feature sets that are dropping. You have to play with them to understand what they can do. Now you don't have to go and play with absolutely everything, but within the tools and workflows that are most relevant to your domain, whether you're a designer, developer, creator, a non-technical salesperson, doesn't really matter. You gotta dive into the tools that are at the forefront of impacting your own domains. And so for me, that's playing with all the latest perception AI, generative AI, and computer graphics tech. It's playing with all the geospatial tech. I do this on an absolute weekly basis. And I call it playtesting. The way you think about it is like, find your way of discovering what to play test, whether that's a YouTube channel like this one, whether that's a newsletter like my buddy Rowan Chuang, or just a set of accounts that you'd like to follow on X, LinkedIn, Instagram, whatever your social platform of choice is. There are accounts out there that are curating the latest and greatest that's going on in the space of AI in your specific vertical. And this brings me to the second point, which is as you're going about playing with the latest and greatest, there are two modes that you gotta actively switch between in order to not just play with a bunch of stuff, but apply it to. And I call it sandbox mode versus architect mode. In sandbox mode, you're basically doing undirected playtesting, where you learn these new capabilities. You're having fun, you're surrendering to serendipity, you're open to happy accidents. And I call it sandbox mode because you're sort of like, you're building castles right by the beach and you are perfectly content with the waves coming and washing away everything that you built because we're not intending to ship anything. If you ship something from your playground testing, amazing, but that is not our goal. Our goal is to get lost in a flow state, play around, experiment, and find those nuggets of gold, those happy accidents that will unlock novel insights. So it's in sandbox mode that you learn these new capabilities, but then you switch into architect mode where you apply those newfound superpowers to a concrete project. This is where you set a deadline for yourself. You've got a deliverable. Maybe it's a paid project that you're doing. Maybe it's a personal project. It doesn't really matter. But based on the new capabilities that you've learned and the existing stuff you already know, come up with a discrete deliverable project, whatever it is. It could be just as simple as an open source GitHub repo or a new YouTube video or an X thread breaking down something, whatever it is, it doesn't really matter. The point is you are in execution mode. You are building the skeleton, then you're gonna flesh it out and you're finally gonna polish and ship this thing. And that's where these untested capabilities meet production and you unlock a new set of insights. Now these insights will be super helpful for you because you're learning effectively how to take new capabilities and apply them to an existing workflow and do that over and over again as we get new primitives and capabilities to play with. So this is very, very important. Now, typically in large companies, you'll have these functions sort of split up between, let's say, research scientists and production engineers, right? They're the researchers that are kind of figuring out the art of the possible, they're pushing the boundaries, but they don't really care about serving this to millions or billions of users at scale, right? There's another team that worries about that. I think you have to kind of apply that same thinking to whatever function you're in. Like even as a researcher, you need to be looking at the latest capabilities at your disposal to push the frontier of your own research, right? So there's an architect mode and a sandbox mode within all of these domains. And I think this is also how you keep things fun is when new things come out, you have to sort of spark that childlike wonder inside of you that is excited about getting up in the morning and playing with these tools and capabilities. My buddy Matt Wolf put up a post on X where he was talking about experiencing burnout. And I think 
One of the reasons for burnout can be when you find yourself sort of creating a treadmill of your own design, this exhausting treadmill that you need to get on every single day and it's just not fulfilling for you because you're not seeing any new scenery. You're not sparking moments of joy. You're not surprised anymore. You're not having moments of excitement. And that's because you're not doing enough play. That's what I usually find when I talk to people that are burnt out is they're just not doing enough undirected playtesting in this sort of sandbox mode, as I'm calling it. And they're far too much in architect mode. And so if you're in the business of architecting, let's say a week in review video like Matt, and every week, that's the thing you're doing, a week in review, week in review. And eventually, all of the capabilities just sort of blur together, and you're effectively doing what perhaps is gonna get automated very quickly anyway, right? So one of the other incentives is to do this type of undirected playtesting is very much so that you come up with novel insights that at least AI systems and agentic AI systems aren't capable of doing today. All right, so let's say you're in architect mode and now you gotta go out and share this thing. So you build up you know, a set of new tricks, you know, new tools in the toolbox that you got, and you go build something cool with it. That's your concrete project. Now you have to go share it with the world, which brings me to advice number three, which is build an island of influence. Look, building in public isn't cringe. I know a lot of folks are like, oh my God, it's so overdone. But I would say building in public isn't cringe. It's a damn near necessity. In this world that we live in where barriers to creation continue to shatter, there's gonna be a whole new set of voices that are gonna be putting their message out there on all sorts of modalities, right? Text, Substack blogs, podcasts, YouTube videos, Twitter threads, whatever. You're seeing this happening already. There's a whole new crop of creators that come up every time barriers get shattered like this which means there's gonna be a lot more competition. And so I think people who build their island of influence now, in this window of opportunity that we have, before you're listening to an AI-generated version of me, giving you tailored, customized, personalized video, it might be building a following of 3,000 people on LinkedIn, and that's perhaps all you need to make a dent in your professional goals, let's say to move ahead in the visual effects industry. The 3,000 interesting people that can follow you, that can get you the right kind of jobs in the entertainment industry might be all you need. On the other hand, it could be a substack of 5,000 people in San Francisco. You just care about the coastal cities, perhaps. Whatever it is, right? It doesn't mean chasing hundreds of millions of folks. It just means building an island of influence. And the only island that you can truly own in this day and age, quite frankly, is a newsletter. So in summary, you gotta build some form of discovery, whether that's short form platforms like TikTok, X, or it's long form content like YouTube, podcasts, et cetera. But typically when you're starting out, you'll find that these shorter form platforms are easier to get disproportionate attention to what your follower count is. And that's because most of these short form platforms don't actually care a damn about how many followers you have. The 2000 person account has just as much of a chance of their post going viral as the 2 million person account. And that's really, really cool and important. That means you need to get as many at bats out there as possible. And what's really important about that is like you're building this island of influence, right? And the main thing you need to figure out is what is a sustainable way for you to create content? And the way you figure out what is sustainable for you is essentially author in the medium or modality that you are most comfortable in, where you produce your best work. Like for some people that involves sitting down and toiling over a script and then reading it out with a teleprompter. For other folks like me, it's all about coming up with a good outline, a few bullet points, and then riffing on it in a conversation like this. So it really depends, whatever it is, whatever fashion you do your best creation, whether that's written, verbal, maybe that means walking out outside and doing a bunch of voice notes and using an LLM to turn that into something else. It doesn't really matter. Find that modality that you do your best thinking and work in and author in that. And then commit to one piece of hub content. What I mean by that is that could be your weekly Substack, That could be your weekly YouTube video. That could be three threads that you decide to put on X. Doesn't really matter. That's your hub piece of content and then you'll derive everything else from it. And so if that's your 30 minute you know, YouTube video or Substack video, you know you can derive a bunch of supplementary tweets to build that top of funnel attention from that hub piece of content that you create. It's called the hub and spoke model. It's very simple, very popular framework, and it's been around for fricking ever. And I think that's very important for you to do in this world where like, it's only gonna get easier to create content. So you, you need to start building that audience of folks that matter to you and engaging with content that is clutch. Because think about the future, right? Eventually you're gonna be in a place where there's gonna be this tsunami of generative content where every brand, every startup can then pick like the perfect combination of Marquez Brownlee meets Cleo Abram, tailored to their brand. And that's basically like the puppet creator, like the owned and operator, that's sort of the white label creator for that brand. 
And you're absolutely gonna see this happen. In a ways like Lil Michaela and all this other stuff is just scratching the surface. And the last piece of advice is learning classical tools is key. You have to learn the incumbent tools in your space. You know, it's crazy. I was at this Harvard XR event at the Graduate School of Design there. There's a bunch of these Ivy League kids and you know, they're all master students in very deep in their specific fields. And they're all coming and asking me questions like, oh, like, should I learn Unreal Engine or should I still like develop my Blender skills? And it's like, yes, of course you should. Because I think people overestimating how much of a disruption uh, some of these technologies are and underestimating how central of a role these incumbent tools will continue to play for the time to come. Let me give you a great example of this. Right now, if you're in the AI video space, yeah, it's amazing if you can go create amazing things in Runway or, you know, Pika or whatever. It's fun. Yeah, maybe you can even create a bunch of viral tweets. But the moment you want to create anything narrative, you need to learn a nonlinear editor. Now, yes, you can debate whether the nonlinear editor that you learn is Adobe Premiere versus like DaVinci Resolve or maybe the newer crop of tools like CapCut or Descript. Like for example, I'm recording all of this in Descript right now. For these kind of conversational videos, I find it really fun and intuitive because it lets me get into a flow state. I just literally open the application up on my Mac, I hit record, everything's recording, and then I can go edit it like it's a document and that's it, I'm done. I'm not worried about the motion graphics or anything like that. There's a whole class of creators that are doing very sophisticated editing on the desktop version of CapCut as well. But then there are folks that really want to go into learning After Effects, for example, or you know, really like color grading and want to go into DaVinci Resolve or think it's far more stable than Adobe. Whatever those reasons are, go learn a nonlinear editor. Similarly, you also need to learn compositing. Image-based compositing, I don't care whether you do that in Photoshop or Canva or Procreate. And then of course, on the other hand, you need to learn video compositing. So that you need to learn tools like After Effects. And that's where Adobe does have an advantage. It's the biggest tool, unless you go into like really high-end stuff in Nuke, uh, node-based compositing, or maybe you're using Fusion if you're like a DaVinci Resolve person, you gotta learn how I can take multiple plates of videos, other elements, 3D elements, and composite all of that together seamlessly. It's a very important skill to learn. Because for now, that is the bailing wire and duct tape you need to ship stuff. In other words, applying all these superpowers to a concrete project that actually makes a difference in the world. But it's also the thing that AIs will be able to do for you. So for example, MCP servers have been very exciting, essentially giving LLMs the ability to interface with all these other tools and use them, right? So you can have Claude use Blender for you. How crazy is that? But does it help to know what Blender can and can't do and how to go about doing it to command the LM to do it for you? Absolutely does. It's like being a visual effects supervisor that's actually done all the other roles. You're gonna be better at it. In other words, if you're good at prompting humans, you'll be good at prompting machines in the future. But the only way you're good at prompting humans or prompting yourself to do something is by doing it which means learning classical tools is key. And as these things keep getting more and more automated, it will be akin to that person sitting on the computer using it for you. And you're the creative director, you're the conductor of the orchestra um, asking for things to be done a certain way. And particularly on the 3D side, where I would say AI is the most nascent thus far. Yeah, you get some cool text to 3D or image to 3D models out there, but the way you bring it all together is in a 3D first tool. And that means something like Blender, or Unreal Engine, and ideally both. But as you learn these classical tools, think of how much of an advantage you have then in any time in history. Not only do you have YouTube University, a plethora of video content, unlimited courses that you could possibly buy for whatever it is that you wanna learn, down to the sub-vertical and niche that you're into, you can also ask AI to help you out. So there's the whole MCP server thing, but even if you just go into Gemini AI Studio, you can share your screen and get in-context advice. And that's wild, right? Because yes, you've got YouTube University, but all of those videos have been digested into this amazing model called Gemini 2.5 Pro and Gemini 2.0 Flash. And you can ask it to give you advice in context to what you're doing on the screen. So learning becomes so much faster because whatever path you need to traverse, you don't need to go through what I had to do which is take these like 3DS Max Bible books with a CD-ROM at the end of it and go chapter by chapter and make sense of it. You can go find that tutorial on YouTube or ask AI to help you accomplish the exact thing that it is that you wanna do. So definitely continue learning classical tools. It'll get you familiar with the workflow too. And now look, I get it. This can all feel just a little bit overwhelming, a little bit exhausting. We seemingly get a new Lego primitive every couple of weeks. But let me tell you, even the existing primitives have not been put together in the most obvious combinations, let alone all the non-obvious insights that you'll uncover as you put these capabilities to work against your own creative and business problems. So if there's one last piece of advice that I'll leave you with, 
that in this world of tremendous change, of tremendous opportunity, and seemingly zero barriers to entry, is that if there's one thing that you can't do, is nothing. This is your moment to act. Because in this new world, the only limit is your imagination. Now that's it for this video. If you have other pieces of advice for folks like us that are on the frontier of emerging technologies, embracing these new technologies and integrating them into our daily lives, into our livelihoods, into our workflows, leave some advice down in the comments below. What has worked for you? Is there some new maxim that you live by that makes it a little bit easier for you to navigate this time of insane change? I'd love to see what you come up with. And before you go, if you're curious about how do you take all these primitives and put them together in very interesting workflows that mix classical and new age tools, you might enjoy this video called Vibe Coding for Creatives, where I walk through exactly this. All right, that's it. Bilavel signing off, and I will see y'all in the next one. Cheers.